¿Cómo están? Bienvenidos a De Chef a Chef nuevamente en este sábado delicioso. Y el día de, estoy, de hoy estoy muy contenta porque tengo a una persona muy especial, una persona muy importante, que nos va a platicar de un tema también muy, pero muy importante. Él es el chef Joseph Yusef, viene desde Londres, para platicar de la cocina multisensorial. ¿Usted sabe lo que es esa? Yo más o menos, pero él está aquí para explicarnos. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Well, It's let's start. I'm going to ask you in Spanish, and she's going to translate, and then sure. you are going to sta um, start talking in English, and we are going to put some subtitles. And perfect. Perfect. Lo que le acabo de decir es que, para que sepa usted, señora, voy a preguntar, nuestra traductora especial, especializada, que es Uri, Uri, este, va a traducir, y él va a contestar, y usted lo va a poder ver en sus títulos para hacer esta conversación más viva, porque está muy interesante. ¿Qué es la cocina multisensorial, mi querido Joseph? What is multisensual gastronomy? Multisensual gastronomy is about looking outside of the kitchen and understanding how the guests experience food through all their senses. We live in a world that is made up of sensory experiences. Right now, as I'm talking to you, you're using your ears to listen to I'm me. Using, I'm everything, my five senses. That's it. <laughs> so my five senses are with you. And exactly. Okay. And everything that we do in life, when we um, are cooking, we maybe are listening to the onions frying away. When uh, maybe we have our back turned and we, we smell something burning, we turn around and we, we use our senses in everything that we do, in the kitchen, outside the kitchen. This is how we understand the world. And multisensory gastronomy is really about having an understanding of our senses and how that our senses interact, how we as human beings interact with food, how we understand the food, how we relate to the food. And as a chef, if you have an understanding of how all these kind of sensory elements come together in a dining experience, you can start to maybe tweak little areas and start to try, hopefully as a chef, to give guests an even greater experience. So the food is always, as a chef, going to be extremely important. I think this is always our primary concern. But sensory gastronomy is about looking at the guests' overall dining experience. Now we've done research into sensory gastronomy and what we've found is that guests who come to our dinners, we've asked them about maybe two or three weeks later, mm -hmm. what their experience was like. And what we found, and I think no chef ever wants to kind of admit to this, but people have, our guests, and I think people, humans in general, we will remember more about the dining partner that we were with. We will remember more about the interaction that we had with the waiter or the waitress, the music, maybe the temperature, all the other kind of elements that make up a great dining experience. And the food, although maybe very, very, very important when you're sitting there and dining, in memory, it's very hard to actually recollect flavors and tastes. It's much easier for us as humans to remember interactions than it is foods. So this really is what we are looking at, and a lot of our research focuses on understanding um, our perceptions about food. Okay. Te pregunté esta pregunta, Joseph, porque quisiera saber cómo llegaste. ¿Qué hacías de chiquito? ¿Qué hacías en tu vida? Sé que estuviste en la universidad. Y ahora, ¿cómo llegaste hasta acá? Well, I'd wanted to work in the restaurant industry for years. My father, when I was very young, was a chef, and I think that kind of maybe gave me an interest in cooking and okay. gastronomy. Even though in London, we don't have as strong of a food culture as you do here in Mexico. Um, it's getting much better now, but in Mexico I think people are born loving food. <laughs> um, and as I, I went to university and I studied business and information technology, which is very far from the kitchen. Muy lejano, muy lejano. Yeah. Um, and I worked in offices and at a, after a couple of years I just didn't feel it was me. Um, I found myself in the kitchen and I worked my way up little bit by little bit, working in uh, several Michelin star restaurants in London. And one day I spoke to um, Herve Thies. Uh, Herve Thies I had been in contact with for a number of years. He is the French chemist who coined the term molecular gastronomy. Un chimico? Yes. Okay. Uh, you understand that. Yes. Lo entendió. <laughs> 
So he um, is the one who came up with the phrase molecular gastronomy. And he works with several chefs like Pierre Gagné and um, Heston Blumenthal, very famous chefs. I had Ferran Adria? Oh, and Ferran Adria, yes, okay. of course. Mm -hmm. um, and I had spoken, I would sent him an email um, asking, I'm in London and I want to learn more about molecular gastronomy. And he put me in touch with a group that they do talks on everything to do with gastronomy. Um, I heard the phrase multisensory gastronomy and I thought, I don't know if I'm interested in this. Okay. I thought maybe, maybe this sounds a little bit strange. But I'm interested in gastronomy, so I thought I, I should at least, it's one hour of my time, let me go along and see. Oui. So I went along and the um, person who was talking was Professor Charles Spence of Oxford University. Now, Professor Charles Spence... No, University of Oxford is a very important university around the world. Around the world, okay. yeah. Um, and es, perdón, pues, eh, la vez estuve en, como son los pioneros, en la Universidad de Oxford, que es una de las más importantes del mundo, y le estaba dando una clase de psicología. Okay. So, Charles Spence mm -hmm. is an experimental psychologist, and his area that he has chosen to um, focus in on is about cross-modal studies. Um, and cross-modal studies is really about how each of our senses interact with one another. Because he loves food and he's a foodie at heart, he has put a lot of his energy into understanding cross-modality from a gastronomic perspective. Um, he has worked with Fran Adria, he has worked with many, many great chefs um, all around the world. So when I sat down and heard his lecture, to be honest, that pretty much changed um, my way of looking at gastronomy and it, it, it really opened my eyes to so many ideas that I think as human beings we all understand how important our senses are when we eat, when we eat with our hands, when we smell food, when we see food. We understand how all this impacts us, but how often do we really think about it? We take a lot of this for granted. We, you know, when you walk in at home and you smell your favorite food being cooked, it opens up your appetite. Uh -huh, claro. But how, how, how often do we really think about this as chefs in terms of when our guests walk in, what do we want them to smell? What do we want them to see? What do we want them to hear? How do we want to stimulate all their senses? How do we want to give them an experience that is not only great from a gastronomic point of view and not only tastes wonderful, but that is memorable and that is remarkable and that touches all their senses. Ferran Adria once said that Cooking is one of the most multi-sensory activities we as human beings um, participate in. And it's true, it is. There are a number of other activities, but cooking and gastronomy and dining and eating, <clears throat> we can say for sure, is one of the few activities that as human beings we need to survive, because without food and water, we we'll have... Moriríamos. Nos morimos. Yeah, we, we die. We, we die. all die. We all die. <laughs> and that's a fact. Um, but food is also at the very opposite end as well. It's a great source of pleasure. Yeah. It's a great source of entertainment. It's a great source of sharing and community building. And it gives us who likes what, what's better than sitting with your family having dinner going on a date and having dinner, celebrating your birthday and eating birthday cake, fiestas and birthdays. Fiestas, fiestas. And, you know, this is, food brings us together as community. Food gives us pleasure. Food, it's, it's vital to us. Now, there's very few other things that we need. And I think because food is so important to us, we, we develop so many kind of um, associations and perceptions about food that maybe we don't concentrate or focus on but for us as chefs I think it's interesting for us to focus on that and to concentrate on that and to start to understand are there patterns are there certain things that we all appreciate about food and there are but sometimes these change from one region to another and I found patterns like this from differences that we have in Europe or particularly in London mm -hmm. to what patterns there are here in Mexico so I can give you one kind of example. Por favor. Mm -hmm. If you ask people in England, um, let's say, what taste they associate with the color red. Initially, we kind of think, well, red, you know, do I have... Strawberries. 
Fresas. Strawberries, okay. And in England, this will be, I'd say, about 70% of people will say it's sweet. Red should be sweet. Sweet. Mm -hmm. What I found over here in Mexico, a lot of people, when you ask them what color, what, what should red taste of? Salsa. Sour. Salsa, sour, yeah. Yes. There's that soury sí. kind of, yes. Claro, jitomate. Exactly. Tomero. Yes. Ah. And this is a very different association. So, I think if I'm a chef and I want to maybe put an element that I want my guests to perceive as being sweet in England, I would need to use, um, for sour, it would be green in England mm -hmm. that we associate. Well, limes, limes, limes and lemons. sour candy, and this is, we see green in England as being sour. Or, I'm saying the majority, not yes, everybody, of course, of course. but mm -hmm. this is all, I think the important thing about this as well is it's all about perception. So it will change from one person to another. I think through academic study, you try and look at big patterns and big numbers to try and find um, correlations in some way. Um, and what's interesting is we will do the same for sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And in England, we have certain perceptions. And in Mexico, you have different, different. set of perceptions. Mm -hmm. So it will change on um, cultures as well, all these ideas. So. I think generally, as chefs, being able to have this understanding of how color and taste are related is very interesting. How sound and taste is related. So, how important is our sense of sound to dining and eating? It's important. It's important. Now, I don't think it's something that we all think is really, really important, but I'll give you a very brief example. Okay. If we take two pieces of celery. Okay. Yes, I am I. Okay, and I blindfold you. Okay. And I break the two pieces, mm -hmm. and one gives a nice, strong snap. Uh -huh. And the other one, not so, not so strong, it makes a... Which one do you want to eat? The one that... La, la que se partió así, fuerte. Yes. Y que como que se crujiente. Yes. Crunchy. Why? Crunchy. What does crunchy mean? Fresco. Yes. Ah, you understand. So from, exactly, <laughs> so from, from the sound of the food, even if you don't see it, but you hear mm -hmm. that, that nice crisp crack, it tells you something. And as human beings, we're looking for that food that's fresh because it's healthier, it has more nutrients. Yes. And this is things that, whether we think about it when we're making all our day-to-day -day choices or not, it's important to us as human beings. We're still like cavemen, craving nutrition and craving sustenance and freshness in our food. So through sound alone, we can make this kind of distinction and we can make choices about the food that we eat. What's very interesting is you'll find pretty much everywhere in the world, um, if you want to eat a bag of crisps, bags of crisps normally will make a lot of noise. Yes, They're quite yes, yes. crunchy. Uh, continue. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so bags of crisps tend to be quite crunchy. And what they've found through research is that the crunchier the bag of crisps, the fresher we think the crisps are going to be inside the bag. And mm -hmm. this is just something that we make based on a judgment of sound. So sound is very, very important to how we perceive foods. When we eat, chewing the and food, chewing. The we, hear, yeah, we hear crisps and crunchy foods, and that satisfies us. That gives us that satisfaction. A crisp is meant to sound crispy. If it doesn't sound crispy, it's not as satisfying. Ya le tengo que hacer caso a mi productor. Tengo que ir a un corte comercial, pero seguimos platicando de esta maravillosa plática que estamos teniendo. Uri. They need to go to a commercial break. Sure. <laughs> Él nos está platicando de esta cocina que es multisensorial, que de repente nosotros comemos nada más por comer sin darnos cuenta de la importancia que es el, claro, el gusto, por supuesto, el oler, el sentir, el escuchar. Seguimos platicando, ¿ves? Me queda en el oído. Entonces, estábamos platicando acerca de la importancia que tiene el oído en esta cocina multisensorial que muchas veces no nos damos cuenta de lo importante que son los sentidos, no nada más el gusto para comer. So we have, um, we've talked about the sense of hearing and how important that can be. Now, let's take something that's a bit more simple in a way, and we talk about a sense of smell. A smell. Es muy importante. El olfato. Very important. Now, funnily enough, when you ask people about flavor, they talk about taste. Mm -hmm, claro. El and gusto es el más importante we, cuando comemos. And we think of flavor and taste as being one thing, but claro. taste and smell are two different um, senses. Senses. Son dos diferentes sentidos. Flavor is made up of a combination of the two. 
So when we have a cold, when, you, when, you, when we're feeling sick or we have a cold, we say, oh, I can't taste my food. But the truth is, we can still taste if the food is sweet, sour, bitter, salty, but we can't get the flavor of the food. Por supuesto. Now, through research, what we know is that 80 to 90% of flavor comes through your sense of smell. No, de verdad, eso pasa por el olfato, el yes. 80, 90%. Sí. No lo puedo creer. Usted, está, usted lo está leyendo, pero aquí estoy diciendo mis expresiones sí. porque, ok, smell is important. Yes. So, the idea is, our sense of taste, we can taste sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami. Um, what is umami? Oh, umami is... Uh, ¿Qué, ¿Qué es umami? Porque lo dijo y no sé yo qué es umami. Glutamate, it's that, it's that savory taste, it's meaty, it's savory. Um, it's the Japanese word for deliciousness. Okay, muy bien. So, umami was recently discovered as one of our uh, senses of... Taste. Qué bueno porque nunca lo había oído, o sea, ay. She didn't know umami before. All right, okay. Um, so all of this, you know, our, but, but you our, say metallic. And metallic. Metallic. And fatty. And fatty. Yeah. Fatty, grasoso. Yeah. Metallic. Metallic. You know, if you cut yourself and you, it's taste a bit your blood. metal. Ah. It's a, there's a bit of a taste of, you know. The if metallic. you think of uh, stout like Guinness beer or things like that, there's an iron kind of metallic flavor. Sí, es sí, cierto. Yeah. So, okay. um, we, they still haven't identified this as a sense of taste, but there are many scientists looking to see if this is really a sense of taste. So, we're, we're, but it's quite limited. We can count on, the number, on our fingers how many tastes we have. But our sense of smell, our olfaction system, mm -hmm. we can distinguish up to the human, uh, if we have a good sense of smell, we can distinguish up to one trillion different aromas. Un trillion? different smells. De diferentes olores capta el ser humano. Yeah. Y nada más, aproximadamente seis son los sabores que podemos palpar. Es increíble. ¿Usted no está impresionada? Yo sí. So, our sense of taste is very limited compared to our sense sí. of smell. Completamente de acuerdo a lo que acabas de decir. Me parece increíble. Incredible. Yes. So, um, let, you know, to give you an example, if you have an orange and um, a tangerine, you know, a cle uh, clementine uh -huh, and an bien. orange. Una mandarina y una naranja. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you have an orange and a mandarin, if you're blindfolded and you taste, or if you just taste the juice, how do we know the difference? What, they're both a little bit sweet, a little bit sour, maybe a little bit bitter, but how do we know one is orange and one is mandarin? Because your eyes. Por los ojos. Even if I blindfold you, you will still be able to taste Desde. the difference. You will uh -huh. still be able, sí, claro. the flavor will be different. Sí, por Why? Por la nariz. Yes. Claro, huelen diferente. Yes. Son completamente diferentes. So we, we've done um, some research with this, and what we did is a very simple kind of experiment. We cooked a risotto, a very plain risotto. No, fr you know, maybe a little bit of mascarpone, a little bit of parmesan, but very plain. And we asked some guests to eat the risotto, they try it, it's nice, it's very plain, there's no, not too much flavor, it's, you know. And then we sprayed the scent of saffronel. Saffronel is the main aroma compound of saffron. Saffron, okay, yeah. saffron. So we spray saffron and they start to smell the saffron and when they're eating the risotto, now the risotto starts to have the flavor of saffron. No, de verdad. Yes. Inc ¿Cómo? Pero, y si, claro, Because esto, our sense of smell is so important. ¿Todo esto está en un restaurante o qué es Kitchen Theory? ¿De dónde apareció Kitchen Theory? So, Kitchen Theory is a gastronomic research lab. We're not a restaurant. We spend a lot of our time, probably about 60%, 70% of our time, doing research into multisensory gastronomy and culinary research, cultural research, like why I'm here in Mexico now, to mm. understand more about um, Mexican gastronomy and culinary techniques and ingredients. And this is where we spend a lot of our time. But what our focus is, is to bring all this research together, to bring all these experiences and all this knowledge that we gain, and put together very interesting dining experiences for our guests and our menus we develop with sometimes different artists, with different um, academics, with um, obviously psychologists, mm -hmm. with 
um, musicians, and we try and bring all these people together to create a very interesting dining experience for our guests. On the, in one year, we will change our menu twice. So this year, we had synesthesia. Sí, ¿Qué es synesthesia? Synesthesia is... Ah, en, entendió. <laughs> Synesthesia is a neurological phenomenon that about roughly 4% of the world have. Mm -hmm. And synesthesia, people who have synesthesia, it's not an illness. Actually, people who have synesthesia like having synesthesia in most cases. Um, and it's people who, when they hear maybe music, they see colors. And this is in their mind. Okay. Okay? And they can see the colors in front of them. When they read, let's say, newspaper or a piece of paper, even though they see um, the letters in black on white, but they see colors over the letters. Some people will hear words and it will make them taste something. Mm -hmm. And there's many, many, many different types of synesthesia. In fact, what's very interesting about synesthesia is it's only really um, become of interest to psychologists recently because people have all different types of synesthesia and no two people have the same type in a way. So some people when they hear the word bacon they um, see the color green. Someone else with synesthesia could hear the same word but see orange. Or brown. Or brown. Or café. Mm -hmm. Well I'll tell you what's interesting about all our research. Yes, or por favor. Everyone thinks that the research we're doing, it's great for doing very extravagant, interesting, fine dining culinary events. But we are doing this research for a kind of a greater purpose in mind. Now, one of the things that we're looking at is we talked about red and it being sweet in England, right? Or maybe white and it being sweet in Mexico. So, the idea here is what can we do with this? What, what, what can we do with this understanding? A bit of the research that we did in the past said people who ate a red mousse on a white plate and on a black plate s f tasted the red mousse on the white plate as being 12% sweeter than on the black plate. Just same mousse but different plate. Mm -hmm. Now what's interesting about this is if we have this understanding of humans, how we understand food, how we interact with food, wouldn't it be interesting if we can start to look at overcoming some of the health issues that we have like childhood obesity, like uh, malnutrition and like sustainability. So maybe some of the things that we're learning through this research will be able to help with some of the health issues that we have in this world. Not that we will solve them, but maybe we can start to find ways of substituting, so maybe putting less sugar in food and maybe making it a little bit more red. Claro. Claro, por supuesto. ¡Ay! No, qué interesante. Ya ves, señora, yo decía que este tema nunca se acabará, no dejar de platicar con mi querido chef. Yo sé que lo acabo de conocer realmente, pero es un encanto de hombre. La plática que tiene es maravillosa de cómo ha logrado toda esta cocina él y, bueno, por supuesto, un equipo atrás de él, me puedo imaginar. Yo sé, I have only two minutes to, to finish the, sure. the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. Y that, that camera is yours, esa okay. cámara es de él. What can you tell to the students that are studying in gastronomy. What you got you can say for them? Can you tell them that camera, please? I would say it's very important to remember, as I kind of mentioned earlier, no matter what type of chef you want to become, no matter what your ambition is or what style of cuisine that you like, it's always very important to remember how important food is to people and that your job as a chef is a lot more than just about putting food on a plate, it's about the experience that you give people at whatever end, end of the culinary spectrum you choose to um, move your career into. Ha sido un placer platicar contigo. Thank you very much. It's Thank you very much. No, it's no, a pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Gracias, Josep. Gracias. Bueno, pues, ¿qué tal nuestra entrevista el día de hoy? Tengo un excelente fin de semana, lo que queda de este. Este, nos vemos la próxima semana en De Chef a Chef, ya lo sabe, todos los sábados a las 5 de la tarde, aquí lo estamos esperando. Les mandamos un beso y un gran abrazo. Hasta luego.